through 9, Paul is accused of being a false apostle, and the reason why this accusation is made against Paul is because he did not take a salary from the church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 16 through 18, Paul is accused of running some type of religious scheme against the church. Uh, go figure that, but this, this is the confluence of things that are before Paul. They are questioning his apostolic authority as an apostle. If you question Paul's apostolic authority, then everything that he has written in the letters he has sent to the church of Corinth cannot be followed, they cannot be obeyed. That is false doctrine. Why? Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 37, Paul says, if any man think of himself a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Paul has made this point clear. I know he's writing to the church at Corinth because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse, verses 1 through 2, he's speaking to the saints, those called out. I know this is the church because in Acts chapter 18 and verse number 8, those who were called are those who believed and were baptized just like Gaius. I know Paul is writing to the church, but these are things being done to Paul by members of the church. Come on. My topic again is truth. The ultimate winner against all opposition. When we look at the context of my topic this morning, we must understand and recognize what is the source for truth, if you will. What is the source for truth? I know the Bible says in John chapter 17, verse number 17, to sanctify them through thy truth, thy is. Somebody over there is helping me preach this morning. That's all right. Look in the Bible in Numbers chapter 23 and verse number 19, which brings us to our first point, the source for truth. We go to the Old Testament because this is an example we need. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he, shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 16 through 18, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them, an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. What's the oath? That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to do what? the source for truth. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the things set before us. So if the source for truth is from an immutable God who is sovereign in his authority, if he cannot lie, then God is the source for truth. Well, how has God delegated or transferred his truth to us. Look at John chapter 7 and verse number 15 through 18. The Bible says, Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine. So Jesus is saying that I didn't come up with this on my own. It doesn't belong to me. But it says, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. We are talking about the source for truth. The Bible says in John chapter 8 and verse number 28, then Jesus uh, uh, then said Jesus unto them when ye have lifted up the son of man, then shall ye know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself but then there's the conjunction word but as my father hath taught me, I speak these things. Then Jesus says in John chapter 12 and verse number 48, that he that rejected me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that hath, the word I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Look at verse number 24 of John 14. He that loveth me, uh, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hears not mine, but the 
fathers which sent me we're speaking about the source for truth so God is sovereign in his authority God is the source for truth but Jesus also makes the assertion that he too is truth the Bible says in John chapter 14 and verse number 6 Jesus saith unto him I am the way the truth and the life that no man cometh unto the father but my me look at the relationship that sovereign God has with his son the Bible says in Matthew chapter 17 and verse number 5 uh, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased hear ye him the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1 that God who in sundry times and divers manners uh, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things we're talking about the source for truth God is the source for truth Jesus himself is also truth but I make a contention also that the Holy Spirit is also truth. Look what Jesus says in John chapter 16 and verse number 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them. Watch verse, watch, watch 13. How be it when he, who, Jesus, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into what, Jesus? All truth. Why? For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Here's his mission. He shall glorify me, for he shall not receive a mine, and shall show it unto you all things that the Father hath a mind. Therefore said I that he shall take of he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So the source for truth is God. Jesus also is truth. The Holy Ghost is also is truth. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, Brother Williams, uh, that that there are three who bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one. So the Godhead is truth. Now look how truth was delegated to holy men of God. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 28 and verse number 19 and I'm going to paraphrase this, that when a prophecy is made, that you will know the legitimacy of the man making the prophecy if these things come to pass. The Bible says that according to scripture in uh, 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 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's how the Spirit worked uh, with holy men of God to convey or to record the will of God where we still have a truthful record that we can read about today. So the source for truth. Paul's credentials. Keep in mind it is Paul's apostolic authority and his integrity that is under attack. The Bible says in 1 John chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse number 1 that Paul was called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenes, our brother. Paul would recount this in Acts chapter 22 verse number 14 through 15 when he was before Felix and Agrippa that he was called for this task. Uh, the Bible says in Acts chapter 9 verses 10 through 16 that Luke would record that uh, Jesus was speaking to Ananias and communicated to him that Paul shall be my chosen vessel to the Gentiles. That Paul would suffer many things. Paul was called to be an apostle by Jesus Christ himself. He met Jesus on that road to Damascus and in the midst of that conversation he was instructed what was necessary for him in which he was no longer in opposition against the truth I'm coming down the road in just a moment they're questioning Paul's apostolic authority and his credentials the Bible says in 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 Paul says are they Hebrews? <laughs> so am I are they Israelites? so am I are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received our forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and day I have been in the deep. In journeys often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils amongst false brethren in weariness and painfulness in watching its often and hunger and thirst and fastings often and cold and nakedness beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily the care 
of all the churches. So he throws down this garland. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Paul's credentials, his apostolic integrity, had been called into question. But he has thrown down the gauntlet that in the course of my ministry, no fool would willingly go through what I've gone through. No man would suffer willingly the things I have suffered for his own behalf if it wasn't for a higher cause. That cause being, God had chosen him specifically for this task, though one born out of due time. But my topic is truth, the ultimate winner against all opposition. We've laid out the source for truth. We've given you Paul's credentials. But now I want to talk about the futility of opposition. Paul knew a thing or two about being in opposition against the truth. His inspired admonition should resonate even more with us. As a former persecutor of the church, Paul's inspired words should carry deeper meaning for us. Look at Acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 5 and I want to focus on something that Jesus said to Paul. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and, and desired of him letters to, to Damascus to the synagogue that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound to Jerusalem and as he journeyed he came to Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven stay with me and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? this is Jesus speaking look what else Jesus says it says and he said who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Notice my topic, truth, the ultimate winner against all opposition. Look what Jesus says. He says, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now Paul, being someone of Hebrew uh, uh, pedigree, will understand what Jesus is saying. To kick against the pricks in its context deals with an ox goad. That when someone is plowing a field, he has a stick that has something pointed that goads or pricks that ox to go into the direction that he wants him to go. Jesus is telling Paul that it's not difficult. That word hard there is not difficult. Jesus is telling Paul that it is impossible, judge. It is impossible to kick against the pricks. If a man is tending that ox and that ox refuses that pricks, he will do so to great injury to himself or even death. What Jesus is telling Paul that you are fighting against me, you are persecuting against me, but you will lose. Somewhere I used to watch a TV show where there was this uh, cybernetic uh, organism that, that said that resistance is futile. You watch that show too, I see. But I also want us to see that Paul's teacher, his mentor, one of the great educators in Judaism also made this statement. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse number 34, Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had a reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And he said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up the oldest, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who were slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him, he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, look what this doctor of the law says. There's some doctors who got some good common sense. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God and if you haven't looked at God's record against all competitors God is still and will always be 
undefeated. Well, why is that, Brother Flunder? Because God has a determinate counsel and foreknowledge that cannot be stopped. Peter poses this question regarding those who are opposed to the truth. He says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 17 through 18, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, watch this, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner be? Well, Paul answers this question in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Understand, church, that uh, when truth is opposed, not obeying truth carries consequences. With the afflictions that Paul is enduring, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, Paul is boasting in the Lord, persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I, en I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Look what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12. Beloved, think are not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice insomuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, watch this, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On that part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, as a busybody in other, uh, in other men's affairs. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. We have established that God is the source for truth. We have established that Jesus is also truth, that the spirit is truth, and that the word communicated to the apostles and the other holy men of God is also truth. We have established Paul's credentials as an apostle. We have established that the futility of opposition is eternal death. But now I want us to understand truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth and the life, that no man cometh to the Father but by me. One of the greatest conspiracies that has ever taken place in the course of human history can be found in John chapter 11 and verse number 53. It says, and from that time they plotted to kill him. Those chief priests, those scribes and Pharisees had conspired to kill Jesus, who was also truth. They conspired to kill truth. They didn't understand or they refused to believe that truth had stepped down from heaven, Brother Brown. That when truth stepped down from heaven, truth was born of a virgin. The Bible says that truth lived for 33 and a half years. That truth's ministry took place over a course of three and a half years. Truth went about confirming who he was through miracle signs and wonders and confirming the teaching that he also did. The Bible said that it came time for truth to fulfill his mission. Truth said in John chapter 12 that if truth be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. This truth said signifying what manner of death that he that that uh, should befall him. The Bible says that truth was in the garden. Uh, he was praying to his father, let this cup pass from me. Uh, truth had already received his answer in eternity. The Bible says that truth went to his father three times and he was sweating as of drops of blood. The Bible said that the time came for truth to fulfill his mission. They came and arrested truth, but what they didn't realize, truth was already walking in their direction because he was giving himself as of a lamb who was spotless and without blemish. The Bible says that they took truth before two kangaroo courts. They took him before the high priest and the uh, Annas and Caiaphas and they had false witnesses bear uh, the lies against truth, but truth was truth. Uh, truth was absolute no matter 
what they said, uh, it had already been instructed in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 16 through 18, uh, that the source for truth was going to remove the refuge of lies that these men told against the truth. The Bible says that they beat truth. They heap truth in his mouth. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number 6 that truth would give his back to the smiters, Brother Robinson. The Bible says in John chapter 19 and verse number 1 that Pilate scourged truth. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse number 6 that truth's visage will be more and more than the sons of men, but you may uh, hit truth and make truth look unrecognizable, but truth is still the truth. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter Chapter, 50, uh, chapter 53 and other subsequent verses that truth was going to be beaten. Truth was going to have nails in his hand and nails in his feet and blood flowing from his body, but they still could not stop the truth. They thought by killing the truth that that would be the end of truth, but they didn't understand that this is a part of God's determinate counsel and foreknowledge. It cannot be stopped. The Bible says that when truth died, that they put truth in a bar to open. Let me back up. How much five minutes? Well, let me back up. The Bible says that truth gave up the ghost and died, and one of those Roman soldiers took his spear and he pierced truth in his side. And there flowed more truth. Truth, the ultimate winner against all opposition. Stay with me. So they took truth down from the cross, and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took truth and buried truth in a bottle tomb. They sealed the tomb. The, the Roman soldier was standing outside the tomb, but guess what? That still did not stop the truth. Sunday morning came around. Truth got out the grave. Truth had promised in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, that upon this rock I will build my church. It had already been prophesied in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse number 18 that the covenant with death shall be disannulled. It was. Truth came out of the ground victorious. So let me wrap this up. I got less than five minutes. Paul is dealing with these issues, but he's also dealing with some sin issues of people in Corinth. People who are wrapped up in fornication, people who are wrapped up in sexual immorality, Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you will. I'll, I'll, I'll try to hurry along. Look at verse number 21. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanliness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. This is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and for ten years if I were present the second time and being absent now I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again I will not spare. You can call me a liar. You can say I'm crazy. You can say I'm a false apostle. But you can't deny that the words I'm speaking are the commandments of the Lord. That's why when we get to verse number 8, Paul says, For you can do nothing against the truth. He had confidence of that fact. Because he had seen what men had done to the truth. He saw how truth had overcome their plan. He ran smack dab into the truth on that Damascus road. He committed himself to the truth and fought the good fight of faith on behalf of the truth. The point we don't understand is that it not only can you cannot oppose truth, but we must be for the truth. We need to make league, we need to make alliance with the truth and the truth alone. You can't straddle the fence between truth and error. You can't be for the truth and also for the lie. The Bible says in Revelation that God is going to spew you out of his mouth. No man can serve two masters. He will love one and hate the other. We cannot do anything against the truth but only for the truth. That word for in that context is the same word we see in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 31. If God be for us, who? Us is in whose? This battle that has been going on since the beginning of time. 
God has those he is for, and then there are those who are opposed to God. That record is still God undefeated, and all those opposers, whatever the infinite number will be in the end. So here's why this is important. We are the one church that Jesus built. I know that we have had many challenges and struggles that have befallen us, and many have called us some of the same uh, adjectives or names that they have called Paul. But brother, what I stand for, I can read about in scripture. What I believe, I can read about in scripture. What I just preached, you can read about in scripture. The standard for truth is that it's not enough to just know the truth. You must rightly divide the word of truth according to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15. It is essential that we learn this truth, church. Eat this book. Quit being lazy in our study. Know what the Bible says so you can know if what the man is preaching is the truth or is not. I used to be concerned about the next generation, but I'm confident there are some younger folk here who are just as committed to this truth as I am. But the question is, will you take this truth back to your families? Do we know enough truth to go across the hallway in our own homes? Talk to our kids and our grandkids, our husbands and our wives, all those in our family. When we go to our family reunions, do we take truth with us? Or we sit over there congregating like everything is all right, knowing full well that the day is coming when they got to give an account for the things they've done in these bodies, whether they be good and bad. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 10, for we all must stand before the judgment seat of truth to give an account for the things we've done in these bodies, whether they be good or whether they be bad. Thank you, and to God be the glory. Let the church say amen. amen. Jamie. Uh, you notice I just sat back because he's bigger than me. 